Hi everyone, this is Dr. Smith. Welcome to the first lecture in Module 19. We'll cover toxic metals and elements in this lecture. I want to first preface this by saying the, the footer at the series of these slides which says Jones and Bartlett Learning um, are because I've adapted these from uh, other courses that I've taught. So. Uh, there's nothing that you need to do about that. It's simply my framework for providing you with this lecture. So let's go into heavy metals, toxic metals, and some other elements, and we'll talk about learning objectives next. So by the end of this lecture, you should be able to, or you will be able to, name five primary heavy metals that pose health hazards to humans. I think a lot of us can list some of those right off the top of our heads. We'll go through this in more detail as we go through the lecture slides. Uh, you'll be able to talk about some of the mechanisms for exposure of humans to toxic metals, and this relates back to fall quarter, where we talked about exposure um, and also part of the expo zone that you've recently gone through in another module. Um, one of the things that's very important is when you talk about metal toxicity, we'll be able to distinguish between essential and toxic levels of trace metals. As we all know, and especially of those you involved in nutrition, uh, there are certain metals that we require for good health. But again, remembering back to your toxicology and dose response, uh, a little bit is good and more is not necessarily good. We'll talk a little bit about describing um, occupational settings in which workers are exposed as well as uh, how we're exposed in the general environmental sense to metals. And we'll look at some prevention methods for uh, potentially preventing uh, exposure to those toxic metals. So what, when we say toxic metals, what are we talking about here? These, these include, and the things we'll cover today, heavy metals, for example, lead, which has come to light once again with the Flint, Michigan situation in the water supply. Mercury, uh, we all have heard about this, I believe, especially with respect to um, contamination of mercury in fish that we eat. So here's a good example of where eating fish is good for you, but eating fish with mercury is maybe not so good for you, especially certain subpopulations like pregnant women. Uh, nickel and some other compounds considered heavy metals, and we'll go into the description of what heavy metals are versus other metallic compounds, such as things like iron, uh, tin, aluminum, uh, and some of the more um, uh, trace metals. Um, to frame this, we'll talk a little bit about the circular priority list of hazardous substances. This is a U.S. regulation. Some of you may know it as Superfund. It's the Comprehensive Environmental Reclamation, Conservation, and Liability Act. And that provides a framework for um, the U.S. government, at least EPA, to look at what they consider to be toxic metals and other substances. And so CERCLA um, and the ATSDR, which is a branch of the uh, CDC, has identified a, a list of rank ordered hazardous substances known as the priority list. They go through this list every couple years and republish it uh, based on additional scientific information about the potential hazard for human beings. This list is shown to pose the most significant potential threat to human health because they are known or suspected of having toxicity to humans. And, and this is a little bit of a, a regulatory aspect. They have a potential for human exposure at national priority sites, national priority list sites. The NPL is essentially a list of Superfund sites, which were unregulated um, hazardous waste sites um, across the country uh, that EPA used to prioritize their efforts for remediation, cleanup, and protection of human health and the environment. Um, it is possible for things with low toxicity but high frequency to be on this list. And so you'll see if uh, on an expanded list you would see things like barium, uh, which uh, isn't necessarily of high toxicity to humans, but occurs quite widely because of its use in manufacturing and things like um, oil field drilling. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Here are some of the top substances from 2007. And truthfully, in the, in the years since 2007, this has not changed a whole lot. You'll see at the top of the list, uh, the first three are things we'll talk about here with respect to heavy metals, arsenic, lead, mercury. You go further down and you see cadmium um, and chromium down at number 18. The rest of these uh, we'll deal with in another lecture, which are uh, 
pesticides and organic chemicals primarily. But just to give you an idea, some of the things that are ranked by the US EPA um, as, as potentially the most toxic things are the metals and the heavy metals. This is just a definition here of what that national priority list is. Um, uncontrolled or abandoned waste sites that um, were scored for cleanup. And in order to score them for cleanup, they had to understand what the risks were based on what chemicals and metals and other substances people might be exposed to. So the definition of a heavy metal, a heavy metal is that which has a substance which has a high atomic weight with a specific gravity exceeds the specific gravity of water by five or more times. So you say, well, this is an awful lot of science, but that just gives you an indication of the nature of the definition of heavy metals. We talk about heavy metals with respect primarily to also their classification um, with respect to toxic effects. So major toxic metals have multiple effects. Um, there are essential metals, such as we mentioned before, uh, we'll go into more detail, some essential metals that are necessary for uh, optimal health with a potential for toxicity. We'll talk about some things related to medical therapy where metals are used, and then some things that are kind of minor consideration as far as toxicity. One of the key components or key concepts to understand is that um, heavy metals in general become more concentrated and potentially more harmful as they move up the food chain. This is bioaccumulation, and this means that um, uh, when organisms are exposed to metals in the food chain, and higher organisms eat those, and then higher, even still, organisms eat those, the metal burden becomes higher and higher. So this is bioaccumulation, and it relates to a dose. And as the dose gets higher, the potential for toxic effects also gets higher. Just something to think about as we talk uh, about the specifics of how you can be exposed to these and what kinds of heavy metals um, might be a potential problem as they move up the food chain or into the food chain. Our modes of exposure reflect very closely what we spoke about in fall quarter. We talked more about exposure and risk assessment and toxicology. For human beings, the primary modes of exposure are through the lungs by inhalation of dust, fumes, occupational, and vapors. Uh, we can also have skin contact uh, with dust. Now, most of the heavy metals are not absorbed through the skin, but they can provide a body burden um, that can also then move into the next route of exposure, which is by ingestion. And so if you have a contamination of skin and you think, you know, mostly of animals, but it can also happen with food substances where animals might be grooming, uh, cleaning off dust that has heavy metal contamination, uh, it might uh, settle on your food items uh, in your garden and we can have an exposure that way. So those inhalation through the lungs, skin contact, and, and uh, oral uh, by ingestion. Most of the contact with uh, high concentrations of toxic metals is, is, again, likely to occur in an occupational setting. So people who are working with metals, you think about uh, metal manufacturing or welding, for example, these can be occupational settings with high um, exposure. Lower level exposures result from the ambient environment, and this is kind of more what we think about typically in environmental health. So, for example, children ingesting um, lead or other toxic metals present in paint chips, or us um, being eating. Um, uh, fish and shellfish that are contaminated with uh, mercury, those can be the routes. Lower levels, but maybe more chronic kinds of exposures. So next we'll start to talk about some of the uh, symptomology around that. In acute toxic metal poisoning, uh, this, is, this is poisoning from very high levels over a short period of time, minutes to an hour or so. Uh, it can be an occupational exposure where we calculate these things over an eight hour work day. Um, but these are, these are typically very high concentrations that we are not exposed to in the ambient environment uh, unless you uh, happen to live next to some uh, manufacturing plant or um, otherwise some kind of environmental catastrophe. For example, uh, there's a, a place in um, the former Soviet Union, uh, it's a city called Ekaterinburg, and one of their primary industries was um, uh, lead smelting. 
and because of the uncontrolled emissions, the township was exposed to incredibly high levels and there were some of the effects from lead, uh, very frank effect, uh, neurotoxicity and other things uh, seen in the community because of those releases. So, but again, that's kind of a combination of occupational uncontrolled environmental release uh, in a specific situation. What do we see with acute poisoning? We see, depending on the portal of entry, and that means the route of exposure, the symptoms can consist of an acute basis, gastrointestinal, neurologic effects, uh, some of them are listed here. Um, again, we see these largely in occupational and or uncontrolled environmental exposures where people are um, a subject, like I was mentioning, Ikat Terenberg, uh, subject to high levels from um, uh, other industrial processes. Um, but typically we don't see this in our routine environment. Uh, it's usually an excursion from the norm. Some of the symptoms of long-term exposure, uh, these can be really difficult to differentiate because you have the generalized effects of, you know, some gastrointestinal, it might seem like flu-like, some neurologic things, headaches, uh, achy bodies, those kinds of things. And so differentiating these from a clinical standpoint um, from other causations uh, is a real challenge, especially for occupational uh, um, health practitioners, occupational medicine, um, and also environmental health professionals going out trying to distinguish whether or not the heavy metal exposure was causative. Um, and one of the things we see, and we'll talk about this with specifics, with a lot of the heavy metals, especially if children are exposed, is reduced cognitive functioning. So learning impairment uh, and other kinds of cognitive functionings. We can find these. This relates back to our routes of exposure. Um, and we talk about a potential exposure media here. So particulates and fumes through the air, soil and dust accumulation, uh, water. And again, we'll go back to Flint, Michigan with lead in the water supply uh, and through biota and food. Um, these are all potential routes. There is also with heavy metals and metal exposure in particular, um, a distinction between genders with respect to the effects. Um, studies have been done and research has shown that between men and women or male and female, these differences are largely attributable to uh, hormonal and metabolic processes related to menstruation, pregnancy, and menopause, so very um, uh, related to the, the female gender. Um, but you can also see that there now is an increasing body of research showing that men, because of their differences in hormonal and metabolic processes, uh, can also experience different kinds of effects from exposure to heavy metals. So there is um, not just a, a preponderance of female uh, or effects in women, but uh, there's also effects in men. The effects in men can be the, the neurologic, but also it's been shown to be a reproductive effect in uh, uh, sperm production and reproductive capacity in men. We also always want to think about populations that are particularly susceptible. Here we have fetuses, infants, and children's, children and their exposures. And, and so for these groups, heavy metals are known to uh, present very serious hazards, which can, uh, you know, from if you, if you go back to fetal development into infant, impairment of physical and mental development, damage to internal organs and the nervous system, and some forms of cancer, and potentially even mortality. Um, why is that? Um, we'll talk about that, but it's basically because fetuses, infants, children are not fully formed with respect to their metabolic processes, and that means their ability to um, detoxify, excrete, uh, and also all of their organ systems, uh, including the nervous system, are still undergoing significant development. And so those are particular targets for exposure to toxic heavy metals. Um, nervous system damage is one of the biggest things we see in um, small children, young children, and infants. Memory impairment, difficulty learning, uh, behavioral problems such as um, uh, hyperactivity syndrome or aggressiveness. In the fetal situation we see, because it is so rapidly developing, significant um, potential developmental effects. Why, again, uh, children versus adults or infants? Because a child's body weight is much less than that of an adult. Uh, 
um, children consume more food in proportion to their body weight, um, and that that's not just, not just with respect to food, but it's water and it's also um, just their body surface area, if you're talking about other things, and their lung surface area. So consequently, they receive higher doses of heavy metals that may be present, present in their food or other media. And so you look at it from um, the standpoint of them not being fully developed metabolically uh, with those protective mechanisms that can uh, protect adults from these kinds of effects, um, but simply because their, their uh, metabolism is higher, uh, the organ systems are forming, and they receive a higher dose uh, percentage-wise than an adult would from the same concentration that's present in the environment. And fetal exposure effects, so both lead and mercury have, the, have been shown to have the capacity to cross the placental barrier, uh, potentially causing uh, uh, fetal brain damage. There are other effects as well. Uh, you can have uh, impacts to the um, uh, development of limbs and other organ systems. Arsenic has also been shown, uh, it's not in the slide here, but arsenic has also been shown to have um, the, the ability to cross the placental barrier and produce uh, uh, fetal damage um, as well. So to categorize major toxic metals that have multiple effects, this is, you know, the multiple effects is, is part of any kind of substance we consider to be toxic. Uh, or potentially toxic. Um, but for the list and for this purpose, uh, the major toxic metals are arsenic, beryllium, cadmium, chromium, mercury, lead, and nickel. Now, just strictly chemically speaking, arsenic is considered to be a metalloid that has to do with um, uh, various factors, but we lump it into this category because it is, same, it is the same definition as we saw earlier. It's uh, heavier, the specific gravity is heavier, and arsenic is very widespread, so we consider it in the major toxic metal category. Um, arsenic, very interesting, and this goes for a lot of the, the, the heavy metals. It, the toxicity varies greatly depending upon its chemical form, so um, we've looked at a number of things. There are organic forms of arsenic, which we uh, occur in shellfish, which are not toxic to mammals. But arsenic in its um, arsenic three valence form versus arsenic in its five valence form, uh, the toxicity varies widely as well as do the toxic effects. Arsenic is naturally occurring. All of the metals are naturally occurring. They're not anything that were created by human beings, such as uh, pesticides we'll talk about or organic chemicals, but they're naturally occurring in the environment. Most of the human exposure comes as a byproduct of certain processes or uses of arsenic or arsenic-containing materials um, um, for human use. So refining gold uh, and other metals, arsenic is a catalyst that can assist in that process. Um, arsenic is used in pesticides, wood preservatives, and in many, many manufacturing processes, again, as a catalyst. It doesn't mean that arsenic is the product, but it assists in the formation or the production of these things. And in this situation, as we've spoken before, exposure can come from ingestion, from inhalation, and also from accumulation through the food chain. Um, because arsenic is so prevalent and also has such pronounced toxicity, uh, EPA has set standards. Now, a lot of arsenic exposure in the human population, those of you who remember back to Christy Arthur's um, assignment uh, in fall quarter, looking at, was it earlier in spring? Um, or I'm sorry, in winter, looking at the uh, Bangladesh um, uh, arsenic in drinking water and some of those effects. Um, and so in, in the United States and virtually around the world, uh, arsenic is regulated to the extent it can be in municipal water supplies. Uh, EPA had a standard of 10 micrograms that was announced in 2001. This was lowered from a long-standing standard of 50 micrograms, and the hope is that this is going to help with municipal water supplies treating for arsenic and reducing human exposure. Another thing I want to say as we move on to the potential health effects of arsenic exposure. Um, arsenic is ubiquitous and it is ubiquitous both because of human activity and also its naturally occurring um, uh, status. Uh, and so when we talk about arsenic exposure, uh, for example, uh, in most rice and many food products, uh, 
not because of human introduction, but because of naturally occurring arsenic in the water, soil, and air, um, most rice products contain some level of arsenic. Uh, one of our doctoral students here at the School of Public Health is looking into this um, and the potential for low-level chronic exposure through food and primarily through consuming arsenic uh, or rice which contains arsenic. So I want you to understand again that all of these metals occur naturally. Uh, it just can be exacerbated depending on behavior, depending on the occurrence, depending on occupation, and depending on where you live or the things that are going on around you. So uh, with respect to the potential health effects, remember the category topic is heavy metals with multiple toxic effects, and arsenic is a perfect example. So we can link it to skin, bladder, kidney, and liver cancer when it's ingested, uh, lung cancer when it's inhaled, uh, peripheral vascular disease as a result by any exposure pathway at certain levels, uh, cerebral vascular, cardiovascular disease, for example, hypertension, uh, diabetes has been linked to arsenic exposure, and as you mentioned earlier, um, adverse pregnancy outcomes, spontaneous abortion, stillbirth, and preterm, uh, also some developmental effects. So arsenic is a, is a great example of, of something that we get exposed to all the time. Uh, it's not necessarily, although this is part of the ongoing controversy, and there may be, there is a growing body of evidence to suggest that arsenic may actually be uh, in some um, uh, form or level an essential nutrient for certain metabolic processes. We'll go into that uh, if you're interested outside of this lecture, um, but it is a very interesting um, development with respect to arsenic. So let's move on and talk about beryllium. Beryllium is um, an interesting uh, example of one of our toxic metals. Um, it's used widely in industry because of its special properties. So it occurs widely in the aerospace industry and other industries where um, you need reinforcing uh, uh, with lightweight components. So beryllium is interesting because truthfully the only major kind of exposure in it, it will occur during an occupational setting and employees in metal processing and those industries I mentioned above are the most likely to be exposed. Uh, and via this pathway or via this exposure, uh, inhalation is probably the most important. There is very little ingestion um, and uh, uh, dermal, exp uh, virtually no dermal absorption. It is a class A carcinogen. This means it is it has been linked to the development of a specific kind of condition, beryliosis, um, in lungs of workers uh, milling and operating around beryllium. Um, and so carcinogenicity is a very specific kind of disease, but I point that out because <clears throat> beryllium is, even though we are talking about toxic metals with multiple effects, beryllium is one of those that really we only know of one effect, and that is uh, carcinogenesis, berylliosis in the lung uh, via inhalation. Cadmium is another, um, more similar to arsenic. It is uh, naturally occurring. It is also one of those that has uh, multiple kinds of health effects. Uh, the primary sources for human exposure to cadmium are cigarette smoke and dietary. Uh, as cadmium is a mineral, it occurs naturally in soils and things. Um, it tends to bioaccumulate in shellfish and certain kinds of mushrooms. Uh, but cigarette smoking uh, through the tobacco, which uptakes cadmium uh, sort of specifically to high, relatively high concentrations, is one of the exposures. That's for the general population. Now, Occupational exposures to cadmium, uh, again, are one of those um, more specific kinds of environmental exposures, and this is in the production of batteries, which we, the NICAD batteries, nickel cadmium batteries, uh, it's a catalyst and a, a part in zinc smelting, uh, it's important in different paint pigments and soldering and um, any kind of metal um, uh, processing, you're going to find a higher exposure. So not extremely high, not as, as high as arsenic with respect to its environmental exposure to the general population, but v um, significantly high in occupational exposure. doesn't say that the um, uh, general population isn't exposed to this. 
when we have cadmium exposure, some of the effects can be uh, exacerbation of osteoporosis in women. Um, if children are exposed at developmental stages uh, in males, it doesn't appear to happen in females, but uh, this can actually re re be shown to uh, inhibit lung both bone growth in males and cause a height loss. Kidney damage, this is one of the major things that uh, we look at with respect to cadmium toxicity, uh, is damage to the kidneys. And um, uh, we'll not go into great detail about that whole kind of uh, uh, toxicological and physiological pathway, but um, some of the processes in the kidney are uh, very fine and cadmium can actually result in some pretty significant damage uh, with chronic exposures. We also have elevated blood pressure, other cardiovascular diseases associated, and a classic of toxicology and epidemiology um, is the itai itai disease, which in Japanese means ouch ouch, uh, exposure to um, populations in uh, basically like fishing villages um, uh, to process waste from metal plating and things like that to cadmium, and it caused a severe uh, neurologic effect where it was very painful for them just to be touched or uh, it just resulted in a lot of general. That is kind of the classic um, cadmium exposure situation. Chromium is another metal uh, that's found naturally occurring. Rock soils, volcanic origin. Um, in most common forms are chromium zero. This is elemental chromium. Chromium three, here we get into this, this crossover between those metals which are considered toxic and also can be classified as essential micronutrients, and chromium is one of those. So chromium-3 is an essential nutrient, and uh, if we have a deficiency here, we have a deficiency in certain metabolic processes. However, if you get chromium-6, then this is classified as a carcinogen, primarily through inhalation, but it's also been shown to be a carcinogen through ingestion pathway, and ecologically, it is uh, very disruptive to uh, mammalian species and different species in the higher food chain uh, with high concentrations as it bioaccumulates in the form of chromium-6. So we have an interesting chemistry aspect here and also a dose aspect. Even with chromium-3, it's converted back and forth in the body from 3 to 6, um, but primarily the 3 is utilized directly in um, uh, our standard metabolism. Chromium-6 is known as hexavalent chromium. Uh, exposure to this can cause, and again, primarily through um, exposure, inhalation. Um, it can produce uh, digestive problems, gastrointestinal. Kidney and liver can be affected when it's ingested. And if it's directly applied to the skin, uh, such as in a manufacturing situation or high concentrations at potentially uh, hazardous waste sites or areas where it occurs, uh, highly in uh, the environment, then it can actually produce skin ulcers. It's a fairly reactive compound. Inhaling chromium-6 in high concentrations leads to initially nosebleeds, uh, can lead to perforation of the septum, um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, is a uh, carcinogen when inhaled uh, over a period of time in human beings. Mercury, we've all known of mercury. Again, naturally uh, occurring metal, highly toxic. Um, we don't have a lot of exposure to this from the natural environment. Uh, mercury is contained in a, in a, a material called cinnabar, and if any of you are familiar with this, it's a beautiful red stone that can be carved um, into a, a lot of products. Um, the exposure to mercury there it won't necessarily leach out of the product, but in manufacturing it can be released. And so most of the release in the environment is a byproduct of industrial processes. Mercury is an interesting one in that low levels, um, it, can be, it can be hazardous. Um, in the soil or in the body, microorganisms, microorganisms can convert the elemental mercury, that is the mercury zero, into methylated forms of mercury. Methylated forms are more bioavailable, and so you can have uptake of that, and then internal processes can cause it to become changed over to the chromium-6, which is highly toxic. Um, bioaccumulation can occur in any, any species, essentially, but what we see is that this becomes more concentrated in aquatic invertebrates. What does that mean to us? Well, that means that aquatic invertebrates are food for small fish, which are food for larger fish, which are food for even larger fish, which happen to be the fish that we eat. And so 
the accumulation of mercury through the f mercury through the food chain has become a significant concern because it is widespread around the globe um, and we see it in uh, tunas and swordfish and uh, a variety of species um, and this has created uh, um, a potential hazard for human exposure. This is particularly uh, a problem in uh, women of childbearing age should they become pregnant and here we have the, the two edges of the sword where eating fish is good for you but eating fish with mercury is not. Mercury is another one that has a kind of a historical component to it, uh, Minamata disease. Um, this was a, a fishing village in Minamata, Japan. There was an industrial plant uh, upstream that dumped its raw waste into the bay uh, that the people used for subsistence fishing and they started to see a, an enormous number of birth defects and neurologic effects in adults and just uh, um, traced it back finally to high levels of mercury contamination both in the water and as we mentioned in the previous slide the bioaccumulation in the fish and shellfish that were eaten as the primary food source for this community uh, led to uh, significant concentrations in the people um, and so Minamata disease um, is, is one that um, uh, we call a classic of toxicology and epidemiology from the standpoint of uh, specific effects um, uh, very clear epidemiological uh, correlation. We've also found mercury, it's used in a lot of processes with mining, it's also extracted as a mining product um, and has contaminated numerous mines and communities and water supplies around areas that are uh, mining and smelting areas. Lead is uh, a classic, um, uh, again, from a, a historical uh, toxicology, epidemiology and health perspective and it was thought that um, uh, lead was uh, one of the factors in the downfall of the Roman Empire because of the lead glazes that were used in all the vessels for drinking wine and this can be leached out um, by acidic compounds such as wine and um, uh, it leads to neurologic damage. So some of the sources currently and this is very pertinent to us right now because of the situation in Flint, Michigan, um, uh, leaded gasoline not so much. This was phased out in the U.S. and most developed nations a number of years ago but we still see significant lead concentrations around the world from the use of leaded gasoline for many 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 years and it can be measured uh, uh, in the Greenland ice cap, uh, what's left of it. Um, tap water from soldered pipes and also use of lead pipes frankly in very early water distribution systems and paint lead was leaded paint was common because it's a beautiful white pigment um, and in older buildings especially in the urban environment uh, any of you uh, can be a significant source of exposure especially to children because uh, interestingly enough the the lead and the other compounds in the paint chimps actually lend a sweet quality to it and so it's kind of um, uh, attractive for the kids to eat. So lead abatement has been going on for a number of years with respect to, to uh, buildings and human habitation and anybody who's uh, bought a home or uh, uh, in the United States know there's always a lead paint disclosure uh, in a house of past a certain age. Um, another common source of household lead is imported pottery that you used uh, primarily in food service. So we had a big case about 15 years ago where a bunch of um, lead glazed or glazed pottery coming in from Mexico had lead in it and uh, that led to some exposures and withdrawal from the market. The primary um, effect from lead is central nervous system effects. Um, it, there could be other uh, consequences even when it's ingested at low levels such as kidney and liver damage. Um, but it is one of the most common environmental pediatric health problems in the U.S. and this is again because of the legacy thing of using leaded paint um, and you have that painted on in layer after layer in urban environments primarily where the exposures occur. The dust from the paint rubbing off the chips that the, the children come in contact with are all exposure pathways for lead. Uh, again, it is one of the most common environmental pediatric health problems and can lead to significant neurologic cognitive uh, effects as well as if long-term exposure occurs in human beings, um, in adult human beings, then you can also have other organ systems. And as I mentioned earlier, Flint, Michigan is a classic uh, example of where um, the, the township shifted over its water supply uh, to the Flint River from Lake Erie and the Flint River was um, uh, notoriously, some would say, 
contaminated with a bunch of things, including very high levels of lead. This was distributed to the populace for over a year, and now um, it's come to light as a, a huge environmental issue. Um, in Flint in particular, and this can be with any kind of, as we discussed last quarter, any kind of thing, that this is really an environmental justice issue as well because Flint is primarily African American, it's lower income, and so there's a big uh, environmental justice issue around this as well. Nickel, uh, heavy metal, it's one of the constituents of the Earth's crust. As I said, all of these are naturally occurring. Uh, low level exposure is probably unavoidable. And again, um, the, the primary exposure to nickel is through occupational exposure, uh, appliances, but you can also have home exposure because uh, the nickel cadmium battery, so here we have uh, uh, a double whammy in nickel and cadmium, so you never want to uh, break those batteries open, you never want to destroy them or burn them because that can release a significant amount of this metal. One of the most common reactions here is uh, nickel allergy. It's a contact dermatitis. Again, this is related primarily to um, occupational exposures. Uh, cardiovascular diseases, uh, high blood pressure and other cardiovascular related symptoms, and renal disease as well as potentially fibrosis of the lungs. Fibrosis in the lungs can result from a number of um, exposures to a number of environmental compounds, and this causes a overproduction of the collagen in the lung leading to thickness, so you get decreased capacity for oxygen exchange, as well as uh, inelasticity because the type of collagen in fibrosis that's produced is not what the normal type is and it's much more rigid. So you have a loss of the ability of the lung to expand and contract and actually bring air into the oxygen exchange barrier as well as um, the thickness which prevents oxygen exchange. Um, there is, a, there is uh, indications that nickel uh, for long period exposures can, from an inhalation pathway, can also be carcinogenic. We're going to talk a little bit now about some of the essential metals that have a potential for toxicity. We already touched on chromium, but here are some others. Uh, copper, zinc, and iron are essential for human nutrition. But again, back to our dose response concept from toxicology, can be toxic if ingested in excessive amounts. And so an optimal range, which is if you look on your vitamins, there's an optimal range of these essential metals is necessary to maintain health. If you go above that, then you can run into toxicity. Let's talk about copper first. Now, copper is everywhere, right? Electrical wires in pipes for water distribution in our homes. Um, it's also in combination with other metals to form alloys to strengthen them. Uh, it, it's used in things as a mildew inhibitor for certain solutions or preservatives and also as a, wo a wood and leather preservative. Um, copper as a, as a wood preservative and a leather preservative historically was copper arsenate. So you're combining high levels of copper with arsenic and preserving wood. And so this is one of the reasons in addition to um, uh, uh, the creosote that uh, it was used in railroad ties that if you use them for landscaping, you want to get ones that are as free as possible, and you never want to cut these or burn these, uh, this wood for anything other than what it was intended for. Um, ATSDR, which is the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, part of CDC, estimates that in 2000, approximately 1.4 billion pounds of copper were released into the environment during industrial processing. Um, that includes everything from the, the activities mentioned above, production of those things, as well as the larger scale copper smelting just to refine copper from mining activities. How do we get exposed to this? Uh, it's almost ubiquitous, so it's inhalation or ingestion of food and water containing copper and direct contact if you happen to be um, uh, working with a lot of copper. Now, again, you can have small amounts of this and it's not really going to be problematic. It's when it becomes um, concentrated uh, in levels above the trace levels that it can start to produce problems. These are fairly high in human beings, so if you're ingesting copper, you get some respiratory, if it's inhalation and gastrointestinal, um, some irritation, but high levels, very high levels are known to cause some liver damage and kidney damage and potentially death. One of the biggest uh, pathways of, of copper toxicity is through environmental or ecological pathways and copper can be highly toxic to uh, aquatic animals and so we want to be very careful in disposing of anything. Batteries should not just be thrown away, um, etc. because that can leach into the water system and 
do a lot of damage with the ecological um, pyramid. Zinc, another essential element uh, found everywhere, essentially. It's uh, commercially used as a coating for rust inhibition, um, galvanized uh, uh, metal things, a uh, component of batteries, a component of other metals such to make brass and bronze and other alloys. But uh, primarily, this is a significant nutritional element important for maintaining health. If we consume large quantities of this, we get gastrointestinal problems, stomach cramps, nausea, vomiting. At higher levels, even with some lead to uh, anemia and pancreatic damage, and breathing high concentrations of zinc in a, in a workplace environment uh, causes a, a disease also known as metal fume fever. Um, this is, is again, an, uh, not directly related to the metabolic significance of zinc, but appears to be an immune-mediated response that originates in the lungs. Uh, it's quite significant. It can lead to a lot of things, including fibrosis, um, and uh, essentially an immunocompromised state. Uh, but once again, this is primarily a workplace at high levels um, with unprotected workers or poorly protected workers. Iron, I think, is fascinating because it's, it's found virtually everywhere. It is absolutely essential to, to human health um, in the transport of oxygen and the growth of cells. But it is one of the most important causes of accidental poisoning in children. Why, you ask? Because you think about iron being important for uh, metabolism, important for nutrition, and you think about multivitamins, uh, especially children's multivitamins, uh, which tend to be uh, very candy-like in their orientation, um, and children can easily ingest a, a toxic dose of iron. Uh, the, fortunately, the, the treatment for that, if you catch it in time, is pretty, uh, is very reversible and very uh, uh, treatable. Um, but it is, again, one of the most common things of childhood poisoning is iron intoxication from eating uh, too many multivitamins, be they children's vitamins or adult vitamins. Um, some other groups at risk from iron overload include adult men and postmenopausal women. Again, your metabolic needs change over time, and so just because you need iron as an uh, important thing in, in, in um, uh, development, as you grow older, the requirements are less for iron, um, and so it needs to be monitored very carefully as far as the supplements you might take or any other exposures you might have. And we'll talk very briefly now about some metals that are used in medical therapies. Uh, aluminum uh, obviously is used in more than um, uh, just medical therapy. Um, it's widely found in things, we'll talk about that in a moment. Bismuth, gold, and lithium. Uh, as I started to mention, uh, aluminum is uh, uh, very widely found in food and beverage containers, pots and pans, uh, manufacturing, et cetera, et cetera, but it's also an ingredient in various medicines, cosmetics, uh, aspirin and antiperspirants, and there's been a big backlash in aluminum uh, chlorhydrate containing antiperspirants because you apply it to an area of your body, your armpit, which has a very thin skin, is highly hydrated, and so absorption of uh, aluminum can occur at a fairly significant rate from that. Uh, the, the concern for this came about with a possible association of aluminum exposure and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, I'm not going to go into any great detail about the bismuth, gold, and lithium, but just to know these are considered um, metals, not necessarily heavy metals, um, but they're all metals or metalloids that are used in therapeutic situations uh, that we need to be aware of. And so it's important for us to understand that metals are ubiquitous, um, but we can and should watch the exposures we have to those in all those situations. That's the end of uh, the heavy metals lecture. Thank you so much. We'll go on to the next topic.